Hello and welcome back. Uh, what I have here today are two vintage word processors. Now what these are meant to be is sort of an upgrade from the traditional family typewriter. Uh, but what they really are is uh, they're all-in-one computers that are portable and they have uh, printers built into them as well. And they were really marketed towards people who had a lot of typing to do, uh, but they didn't really want to use a computer either because they, they didn't want uh, didn't have the space for a full computer set up in a printer or they just didn't want to learn how to use a computer. <laughs> now, um, this Panasonic unit here was made in 1992. Now, I know this because it's written right on the back. Uh, this brother unit here is a little bit older. Um, I'm not entirely sure on the date, but that's one of the things we're going to figure out here in a little bit. Um, now, this one is very similar to uh, the one that has been shown a few times on the TV series, The Goldbergs. No, put away the word processor. I am not writing my college essay. So, the main difference is the um, orientation of the floppy drive, but uh, otherwise it's very similar. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you how these work, and um, then we're going to take them apart and find out what's inside. Let's start by taking a look at the Brother WP25. These printers are what we used to call daisy wheel. They rotate around and impressions of the letters are pressed through an ink ribbon. Now it's very unlikely I'll be able to demonstrate this because ink ribbons usually dry out after a few years. Anyway, um, this is how the ribbons are installed. It has a floppy drive for storing your work and lifting the back you'll find the power cable. Let's, let's go ahead and plug this in and see if it still works. Okay, let's flip the power switch. Man, it seems to come to life. It makes some strange noise that doesn't sound right, and it says the backup memory is cleared. I suspect the belt is broken in the floppy drive. By the way, on the top, it advertises the floppy drive as being a 240K, <laughs> which is a really unusual capacity for a 3.5 inch drive. However, after a moment, the noise stops and everything appears to be working. At the top, it says it has about 32K free, which isn't exactly a lot for typing a document. And at the bottom, we see copyright dates of 1988 and over here, 1985, giving us an idea of the times this was in production. So I'm going to take a few minutes to type something on here just to get a feel for things. I really like the feel of the keys and the way they click. The screen is a monochrome amber style, but it is remarkably sharp and clear. One thing I find annoying is the location of the backspace. It's not in the same place you would normally expect it to be on a modern keyboard, or to be honest, even on a keyboard from the 80s. Anyway, I'm going to try loading some paper in just to see if the mechanism works. Loading paper in this is actually more similar to loading paper into a typewriter than it is a printer. In fact, uh, this product actually has a typewriter mode where you can type directly to the paper without using the word processor. So I started to type just a little bit as an experiment, and then after a moment I noticed something miraculous happen. I noticed that after the ribbon moved a bit, it started to actually print ink on the paper. I was really shocked. You'll have to forgive my typos because much like a real typewriter, once you screw up, there's no easy way to fix it. So since we have ink, I thought maybe I should try to print the document I typed up earlier. So um, I'll press print and uh, then it tells me to insert paper and press return. Let's do it. And there it goes. Now, it's been a long time since I've heard the sound of a daisy wheel printer working. This thing appears to be working flawlessly now. Admittedly, the ink should probably be a bit darker than this, but I'm just amazed it's printing anything at all. Now, this thing also claims to have a spreadsheet because these buttons up here do different things depending upon whether you're in spreadsheet mode or word processor mode. But the best I can tell, you have to load the spreadsheet from this floppy disk. However, when I insert the disk and tell it to load the directory, the drive motor comes on and it sounds like the belt is broken and uh, it just gets stuck trying to read the directory. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at the second unit, the Panasonic W1525. It's from 1992, so it is a few years newer than the last one. And this one is kind of weird because the keyboard is attached to the rear of the device and the power cable is down in this hole. The keyboard plugs in on the side using an 8-pin modular jack. Uh, so let's power it on and see what we get. Okay, it comes to life as well. Now this one has a monochrome green screen, which is also very sharp and clear. Now there's a lot of glare showing on the camera, but in person it actually looks much better. In fact, if I turn the light off in the room, you get a better idea. 
Now, unlike the previous model, this one has a spreadsheet built right into ROM, along with a few other utilities. And it's actually pretty simple to use. I would imagine this was used for a lot of people to do household budgets and mortgage calculations and stuff like that. I have to admit that the keyboard is not as comfortable to type on. The keys are a bit spongy feeling, and unfortunately, the backspace key is also in the same irritating location. Now, I want to take a look at the ribbon on this one. While the design looks really similar, something seems very different about it. Uh, rather than looking like fabric, this has an almost glossy look to it like I'd expect from a thermal cartridge. And uh, this white ribbon here, believe it or not, is a correction ribbon. So you can back up and it works kind of like whiteout, uh, which seems kind of silly being this thing is a word processor and thus you should be able to fix your mistakes before you print. But anyway, um, here's how the ribbon goes in. And then you just uh, lock it in like this. And even though I have little hope of this one actually printing either, I'm going to put some paper in there and we'll try it out. Uh, first, I'll type out a little bit more on the screen. And then I'll press print and return to confirm. And there it goes. And holy cow, it's working too. Uh, and it's actually really dark. Uh, so here's what it printed. And it looks like I may have had the margin set wrong, but you still get the idea. Now, this text is super sharp and high contrast. In fact, here it is compared to the brother unit that we did earlier. Granted, I suspect that one would be darker with a new ribbon. But uh, here's where things get really interesting. If I pull the ribbon out now and you have a look at it, check this out. Now, you can actually see where the letters were printed. Now, this type of technology is called carbon transfer, and sort of similar to when you use carbon copy paper. Uh, this was used on high-end printers, and of course, the ribbon is single-use. So once it reaches the end, you have to replace it with a new one. Okay, so what we're going to do now is take these things apart and see if we can figure out what sort of computer architecture that they actually run on. In fact, that was the main reason I wanted to make this video, is to find out what kind of secrets these things have inside of them. Uh, the second reason that I wanted to make this video might be somewhat less obvious, and that's because I've got three other video projects that are currently in the works. Uh, but for one reason or another, I'm uh, waiting on various parts to show up or whatever I need to complete those videos. Speaking of that, uh, maybe somebody could uh, help me out because one of the things that I am in desperate need of that I've just not been able to find um, is I either need to buy or borrow a Commodore PC-1. And um, these uh, just, I just have not been able to find one. So if you have one of those, um, I need that for an upcoming video of Commodore History. So shoot me an email if you got one. I'm hoping this metal plate on the bottom will give us some access to see the motherboard. I'm not seeing any other real obvious ways to take this thing apart. And to my amazement, I believe this is the motherboard right here. Well, let me see if I can pull it out. Yep, sure enough. Um, I'll just need to disconnect a few wires uh, so that I can get a good look at it. And here it is. So uh, looking at the board, um, this is the CPU. It is a Hitachi 64180, which is basically a traditional Z80 CPU with a memory management unit and a few other goodies packed in with it. So this machine runs the same machine code that you would find in a CPM machine like the Osborne or even the Sinclair Spectrum. This next chip here is the 6445 CRT controller. And it's very similar to the 6845 CRT controller used in literally hundreds of different computers of the 1980s, including the Commodore PET and pretty much every graphics card for the IBM PC. These two chips appear to be 64K of dynamic RAM. Interestingly enough, there appears to be another 8K of static RAM here, which I suspect is used as a screen buffer RAM for the video chip. Down here we have 32K of ROM, and here is another EEPROM, but I can't tell what size. And down here is a massive 512K worth of ROM. I suspect this contains stuff like the spell checker and thesaurus. So um, that means there's at least 640K of addressable memory on this board, which is quite a lot for a Z80 based system. Now I can't tell for sure what these two chips are since they're custom chips, but I suspect one of them is an input output chip for controlling things like the disk drive, keyboard, and printer, and the other is probably some glue logic. Anyway, so now we know what everything is on here. Um, I'll go ahead and put this uh, back together. I'm really amazed how simple it was to get to this. I figured I'd have to tear this thing into a million pieces to get to the board. So uh, that was great of Brother to make this board so easily serviceable. Okay, now it's time to take a look at the Panasonic unit. Uh, this design should be at least six or seven years newer than the Brother unit. So it should be interesting to see what it uses. I see it has a similar looking metal shield on the bottom, so I'm going to cross my fingers and hope this also reveals the motherboard. 
And it turns out it does. And even better, I don't even have to mess with it to get a look at it. So I didn't have as much luck identifying components on this board. This is the CPU. It's a Hitachi 6303, which is actually a microcontroller based on the Hitachi 6301 CPU, but it also contains 24 general purpose I.O. pins, along with a tiny amount of RAM, some timers, and other stuff. Over here is an 8K static RAM chip. And I believe this chip is probably used in combination with the CRT controller here, which is not one I'm familiar with, but uh, at least I can identify it as an off-the-shelf CRT controller. Now, down here is another 4K of static RAM, uh, but the rest of the chips I simply cannot identify. I mean, obviously some of these have to be ROM chips, but uh, more importantly, I can't figure out where the 64K of RAM is that the system is supposed to have. So uh, this one is quite a bit of a mystery. Um, I tried looking through old catalogs to see if I could find out what these units cost, but uh, the closest thing I could find was this 1991 Sears catalog, which um, has a very similar looking brother model. Although the model number is different. Um, anyway, the price is $495, but I find it interesting that it's advertised to play Tetris as well. <laughs> That's pretty cool. One other thing I notice, if you look closely at the picture, you'll see that the floppy disk is actually inserted backwards into the drive, which is <laughs> absolutely crazy. Uh, typically, most floppy drives will not allow you to insert the disk backwards, uh, like this one, for example. This is as far as, as it will go. Interestingly enough, the uh, drive on the Brother model will let you insert the disk pretty much all the way, so that's kind of weird. So this uh, brother unit is actually pretty cool because if one had the time to spare, it would actually be a pretty cool hacking project because one of the things you could do, since it has a Z80 compatible processor and a lot of well-documented off-the-shelf hardware, you could, in theory, remove the word processing software ROMs and then replace it with some sort of basic uh, or even some, some games or something like that. Now, granted, I doubt that the video chip supports any sort of bitmap graphics, but... I'm sure you could do like Commodore PET style graphics or something like that on there. You know, I used to see machines like this uh, in the store when I was a kid and I used to play with them a little bit and I was always really disappointed because I'm like, wow, it's like a little portable computer. This would be so cool. You could carry this around. Um, and, uh, you know, they didn't cost nearly as much as uh, some of the other, you know, portable computers that had come out at the time. And, uh, but my only disappointment was that they didn't run basic and they didn't have a serial port. You couldn't connect them to a modem. You couldn't uh, run any other software on them. So anyway, it would just, it'd be cool if, if I did have the time to, to actually hack it, to make it actually possible, even though it'd be 30 years too late. <laughs> um, anyway, that about wraps it up for this episode. So as always, thanks for watching. <laughs>